A stone is a small mountain. A microplay in three acts. Act one. Eliza and the editor. Enter Eliza. Five foot six. Pisces moon. Leo sun. Here she is, preparing for a meeting with her editor. For all important calls, Eliza makes post-its of what to say and what not to say. Eliza is the kind of person who responds to waiters asking, any allergies? With, none that I know of. Instead of simply no, enjoying perhaps the risk it injects into any meal she is about to eat. Each time Eliza sits in the hairdresser's chair, she says, James, I'm ready for a big change. Then shows her reference photo, always a variation on the same theme, both of them pretending it's new. Eliza, art historian and biographer, is in the final edits of her publication, titled The True Life of Camille Claudel, Sculptor and Artist in Her Own Right, a title pushed on her by her editor that Eliza dislikes because it frames Camille within her tumultuous relationship with her Don, her mentor turned lover turned rival. Eliza's having a bad day today. Rain plus troop strikes equal to men's traffic. The meeting with her editor was changed last minute to a Skype call. On top of it all, the Wi-Fi was down. Eliza switched to her hotspot she'd named Eliza Hot and Googled. Is Mercury in retrograde? The answer was no. Eliza was disappointed that there were no cosmic explanations for her bad luck. It was just plain and regular bad luck. Feeling sorry for herself, Eliza indulged in her guilty pleasure, reading one-star reviews of local establishments. It was the ones with voice, personality, and character she was after. To Eliza, they were like underrated micro-stories, and she scrolled until she found one that she liked. Hmm. One of the members of staff told me I had to leave as they don't allow strippers in the venue. I'm not a stripper. Smiling and satisfied, she took a screenshot and saved it in her folder specifically dedicated to them. The editor finally connected to say, We want more about how she was a muse, Rodin's muse. We, we love muses as a culture, we just do, but artists whose talent was cut short or constricted due to their times, it's just well, sad, really. And we don't want to read and feel sad, we want to read and feel sexy. Right. More sexy. Precisely. More sexy. Got it. Eliza glanced at her post-it titled, What Not to Say No Matter What, and concentrated on the line that said, Fuck you. But then she looked back and responded, Thank you. Anything else? We can cut the part where you list all the reasons why women were institutionalized in the 1800s. But it, it proves that she wasn't. Here's the passage that the editor is referring to. This one was written while Eliza ate frozen ready meals and Charlie XEX's Party For You played on repeat to keep her awake. It's impossible to look at Camille's life and legacy without noting that the reason her career came to an abrupt halt was because she was institutionalized and spent the last 30 years of her life in an asylum, despite doctors and colleagues insisting she was very much not insane. Why? She'd begun to destroy her work, afraid that Rodin would claim it as his own. From the mid-1800s onwards, it was not unusual to institutionalize women who were... <laughs> difficult. Husbands had the power to admit wives against their will, often coinciding with when they wanted to take another wife. The following are some of the reasons listed for admitting women into psychiatric asylums. A moral life, extreme jealousy, Great distaste for husband, imaginary female trouble, bad company, taking medicine to prevent conception, and novel reading. Yep, all of that. It's too much. Cut, cut, cut. Eliza shut her laptop. Fed up, she looked up to address me, the narrator of her life. Dear my subconscious, why is your voice like that? Are you on my side? You tell me, Eliza. Eliza was about to realize that she was sleepy. 
Bad news, rain, always made her sleepy. Alone and about to fall asleep, Eliza let slip a big confession. Sometimes I feel like I'm not the main character in my own life. <laughs> I think that's why I became a biographer and um, not anything else. You know, a sculptor myself, or dancer, the one doing. End of act one. Act two, the dream of Camille. Eliza knew she was dreaming when she heard the violin. Her dreams often featured the instrument, as for most of her childhood, she'd fallen asleep or woken up to the sound of her sister obsessively rehearsing. It occurred to her that in this dream, she was Camille Claudel herself. She studied her hands like they were underwater. The lines of her palm, the blue vein under her wrist splitting off like a fork in the stream. And when Eliza spoke, out poor Camille. My hands were the first part of my body I remember noticing. One day you don't know you're a person, a person with a body. And the next day, here are hands, and they're yours. I looked upon them in my lap, and I knew these were my companions for life. I remember thinking as a girl, without reservation or any feeling of shame at being so vain, my hands were beautiful. Moving dirt around, using pressure and moisture to form shapes with clay, it came naturally, you know, coaxing out figures, knowing limits, how much I could stretch a thing before it broke. When people looked at what I made, they remarked to my father, as if I wasn't present, wasn't listening. This one's got something it's in her hands. It felt like a sign. Them saying it like that. Turns out I was really, really good at sculpting hands themselves. Better than anyone. And feet, too. Feet being so similar. Like the cousin of hands, the way knees and elbows are cousins, or how a wrist is a slimmer neck, and so bracelets are the necklace's baby sister. And so Rodin put me in charge of doing the hands and feet of his major sculptures, recognizing my talent at executing something so difficult and yet so essential. It left no time for my own creation. But I told myself, this was my creation. Getting right the shadow and slope of an angle, the crescent line of a nail. All the things I put up with, just so I could make. The first time Rodon signed his name on my work, I was proud, radiant even how young I was, how new to life. End of Act Two. Act Three, All I Ever Wanted. Hello, your call cannot be taken at the moment, so please leave your message after the tone. Hello, um, Eliza. I'm, uh, I'm afraid we'll have to part ways on this project after all. The edits uh, have not been adequately addressed, you see, and the, the direction of the book is a far cry from the original pitch document. Um, I do wish you all the best, and I look forward to, to seeing um, this book in the world one day. Well, um, best of luck then. It's, it's been a pleasure. Eliza started with some novel reading. She thought, she ought to read one of the classics. You know, those a hundred books to read before you die types. So-and-so is miserable until the very end when the lover appears in earnest and not in the foul mood he's carried for 300 pages. Ugh, no thank you. I decided on some Miranda July instead. 
than Raven Leilani. Essays by Kathy Parkholm. For one endless afternoon, I was Annie Erno waiting for my lover to call. Spend 30 pounds to get an out-of-print book that I used to like as a kid called Dudley Bakes a Cake. Fuck it. I even read some Dune. Then it was time for some extreme jealousy. I knew exactly what to do. Pulled up the Instagram profile of impossibly cute and wholesome influencer living in the countryside with seemingly no regrets, baking pineapple upside down cake for her husband and eight kids on a Tuesday whilst also managing a homemade beeswax candle brand. And then immediately after, <laughs> I searched for hot influencer in the big city who never wears the same outfit twice and posts post-shower selfies with her hair wrapped in a towel, looking like that Drake lyric with no makeup on, holding an anti-aging serum with real gold flakes with the caption, the best thing for getting ahead tomorrow is really slowing down tonight. Hashtag sponsored. Hashtag ad. I scrolled until my stomach was a triple tied knot, and at the end of all that agony, it occurred to me that actually... I kind of really liked them, and mostly wished I could meet the city one for a drink at a a new natural wine bar where the server greets us both by saying, it's so good to see you two again, and so soon, and then take a train out to meet the country one, walking through the woods until we come up to a lavender field where she puts down a tartan picnic blanket and we feast on fresh scones still warm. I ordered clotted cream on Deliveroo. It came in 22 minutes. Took my time making upward sweeping circles on my cheeks with my serum. I had no husband to feel any strong distaste for, but I still thought of the things I should have said to my ex, Oliver. So I made a fake assistant email with Oliver's name and set up an automatic response to all my emails. Hello, I'm out of office until further notice. If urgent, please contact my assistant, Oliver, at assistant to Eliza at gmail.com. It felt unbelievably good. Clearing out my desk and preparing to send my book out to different publishing homes, I found all the post-its I'd made of things I shouldn't say, and I recycled them. I stopped strangers in the street, and I told them exactly what I liked about their outfit. Their coat, the buckle on their boot, the one earring longer than the other. And when people called me Eliza, I finally corrected them saying, it's Eliza! <laughs> it's Eliza, actually. And you know that viral blog where people send screenshots of the most hilarious one-star reviews they come across called If I Could Give It Zero Stars, I Would? Yeah, (laughs) I started that. And during this time, I eventually realized that the voice in my head was mine. Eliza picks up a phone. She dials a number. It rings and rings. Her hairdresser, James, picks up. James, hi. Yeah, I think I'm ready now for that big change. (laughs) 